So, as mentioned, today we're going to talk about radiographic processing. Although the affiliations that we have with hospitals at City Tech don't use radiographic processing in terms of having a developer and an actual film that needs to be fed into it, we need to discuss this because this will be on our registry. Also, not everyone is going to have a job in one of our affiliates. There are still many doctor's offices and other institutions that are still using what's known as screen film. If you're going to use processing screen film, then you need a darkroom. Most of you at this point should be familiar with the darkroom that we have in our lab. There are some departments that have what's known as a daylight processor. Uh, in this case, it's really a darkroom enclosed in a box. A cassette specially designed is placed into the daylight processor. A daylight processing unit will utilize a specialized cassette, whereas this cassette will be pushed into the machine and inside, of course, it is subject to not having a light come in, the machine itself will actually open up the cassette, pull out the film, process it as if it had an automatic processor built in, refill the cassette with a film, close it, and then push it back out for you to take, put on a rack, and then use a little bit later. Generally, you won't see too many of these, as we are now moving into a CR and DR processing environment. When it comes to the darkroom, though, you don't want one that is too big. In this case, size does matter, and the larger it is, the worse it can be. You don't want a situation where you can walk around and hit things after all it is rather dark the color of the wall should be light and this will help reflect the safe light light uh, making the appearance of the room a little less dark the entrance to your darkroom um, varies from place to place in our lab we see it's just a typical door of course it should be designed so that light doesn't come in in all of these situations the light doesn't come into the darkroom it can be what's known as a maze type entrance and in a maze type entrance you have a situation where the walls are designed so that they have 180 degree turns in this case since the light cannot zigzag around the darkroom really has no door but the light from the outside doesn't get in the type of entrance that I am most familiar with is the rolling door which is illustrated over here uh, in this case you step into the door and spin the door around of course the opening now that you've spun it enters you into the darkroom just like the darkroom in the lab though you should always knock on this before just walking in because someone might be spinning around and walking out and you don't want to bump into each other. To get into this room and for the maintenance to clean it, usually this door is on hinges and can be actually pulled off of the wall. <clears throat> features of the darkroom. The darkroom features a loading bench which is what we utilize to place our cassettes on and basically give us something to push up against us when we're doing work. Of course, there's a film bin, uh, as you may have noticed, in our darkroom, and generally most darkrooms work this way. The largest films are located at the front of the bin, also being the heaviest sized films, uh, and they get smaller as you go towards the back. This way, in the dark, even if you close your eyes, you should know where to get film from to fill up a box. Uh, some darkrooms also have what's known as a pass box, which is a device embedded into the wall of the darkroom where you can actually take a cassette, put it into this box, close it up, and then pass it to perhaps a darkroom technologist or darkroom tech, which doesn't really exist anymore for the most part. Uh, actually, our lab has a pass box. If you take a look in the corner where we have our portable machine, uh, you'll see it there. 
and next time, please, someone ask me to point that out. Uh, also, in the darkroom, we have a safe light. Ours is mounted on the wall, but at times you can have a surface mounted or just generally a light that can be moved around. Without lighting in the darkroom, it would be really, really dark and accidents could happen. Luckily for us, we utilize film that is sensitive, or I should say not sensitive, to green or blue. In this case, we can utilize a red safe light, similar to what's known as the Kodak GBX, or green-blue x-ray. There are some dark rooms which handle blue sensitive film only, in which case you need to utilize an amber safe light. In our case, we utilize a red, and if you notice up here, where it says green sensitive and blue sensitive must have a red safe light, it's thus safe, no pun intended, to utilize the red safe light wherever you are. Just note that it is a very low wattage bulb, and it should be mounted at a distance of about 48 inches. Chemistry. Processing chemistry also plays a key role in image formation. It also affects other image characteristics such as artifacts, surface quality, image tone, stability, and film drying. At this point, right now, when you go into a dark room in our lab, Dealing with chemistry is rather simple. <clears throat> it's there, and basically, what do you do? Right now, you don't do anything. But what we plan to go over in this PowerPoint is just some of the things that involve chemistry and what chemistry actually is all about. But first, there are four main steps in the processing. You have the development step, fixation, washing, and finally drying. And they are in order. When we talk about the processor, there are going to be four separate areas where your film will actually travel through with the use of rollers and chains and gears and motors into different tanks, starting with the development or where the developer is stored, fixation, where the fixer chemical is stored, and then finally a wash and drying section. Development is the first step. It produces the visible image from the latent image which was created when you took the radiograph. In detail, the developer and the chemicals that make the developer up reduce the exposed silver bromide crystals and turn them into black metallic silver. This ends up being the density that appears on your images. If you could see the image at this point, it would be still opaque. In other words, it's still undeveloped emulsion. What lies next is that this image must be fixed onto the film. The second step after the developer is fixation. In this step, there is a clearing process. All development ceases. The emulsion is hardened. This hardening reduces the possibility that the image will be scratched as it passes through the wash and dry steps. Second to last is washing. This removes any leftover processing chemicals from the emulsion. 
If washing is not sufficient, the film will deteriorate in storage. Any of this leftover chemical residue, over time when an image is left in a file cabinet, will slowly change the colors and deteriorate the film. Finally, the drying process. The drying process removes moisture from the film and makes it suitable for handling. The term wet read once described an image coming out of a processor that was still wet before it had actually dried and you wanted to get that to the radiologist to make a decision on someone's life. This had to be done quickly. Before we discuss automatic processor sequence and processing, I'd just like to mention how it is possible to contaminate the processor. Based on the four steps, development occurs first and then fixer or fixation. A film travels from the developer, then moves into the fixer. However, if any of the chemistry from the fixer should come into contact with developer, that would be known as contamination. At this point, once your processor is contaminated, all work ceases. Processor needs to be turned off, all the tanks need to be completely emptied, completely cleaned, placed back into the processor, and refilled with fresh chemistry something no one wants to do. Automatic processor sequence and processing. Basically this is how a film makes it through from beginning almost to the end. The film progresses from the feed tray. This is actually in the darkroom. This is where we first place our film lengthwise against one of the sides so that had it been placed in the middle it might flow through and get caught up somewhere in the processor so please make sure to process your film with it towards one side whether it's lengthwise or crosswise should not matter so your film progresses from the feed tray through the detection rollers these are what signal the entrance of a film to the developer tank it's also these sensors that designate when the next film is available for you to process. This is generally an audible sound as well as sometimes a light. From the developer tank it passes through a series of crossovers and roller racks. This leads the film from the developer into the fixer and then into the wash tanks. The film is then carried by the system of rollers through the dryer where it is struck by jets of hot air. Total processing time is generally 90 seconds. Although there are processes with longer and shorter times, temperature is very important to the developer process. The temperature must be maintained and held at approximately 95 degrees. If you remember from a previous lecture, an increase in temperature will lead to an increase in density. Here's an example of an automatic processor. What you don't see is what's on the inside and it's what's on the inside that counts. Well here we are in Google I thought it might be fun just to take a little look and see what kind of images we get when we look up automatic x-ray processes so let's give that a try